Hi, my name is Valerie and I'm a social worker with the Children's Hospital Pediatric Sickle Cell Program and today I'll be talking a little bit about sickle cell disease and education. Hello, my name is Kimberly Major and I'm also a medical social worker with the Sickle Cell Program at Children's Hospital of Oakland and today I will be talking with you about transition. Sickle cell disease impacts every area of a child's life, including their educational experience. Children with sickle cell disease require support in schools to manage their disease. They are eligible for a Section 504 plan which supports accommodations to their learning environment. These include, but are not limited to, having water at their desk or an extra set of books at home. Some children require additional support by modifying their learning. These children require an individualized education plan or an IEP. Establishing an IEP is a time-consuming process and starts with parents formally requesting an evaluation in writing. Neuropsychological testing is an important part of getting the academic support of many of our sickle cell patients. Transition is a process, not an event. Well, one might ask, well, really, what is transition? Essentially, transition is the move from pediatric-centered health care into adult-centered health care. As your teen is growing up, it is important to provide them with the necessary tools and strategies to be able to plan for their future. Some of the tips that I can provide to our parents include encouraging and fostering independence. For example, Encourage your child to be able to speak with medical staff each time that they come in for a medical visit. Another helpful tip would be able to allow your child or young adult to be able to call in to speak with staff about their prescription refills or to cancel or schedule an appointment. It is also important that you begin to assist your child with making a medical record, documenting all of their medical visits, all of their hospitalizations, listing all of their medications and subsequent future appointments. If your child is 18 years old and has not yet been evaluated for Social Security benefits, it is important that you assist your child in doing so. Another helpful strategy to be able to foster independence in your young adult is to be able to encourage them to participate in social, leisure, or recreational activities. Finding a support group would also be supportive and beneficial to your young adult. Healthcare coverage is also quite essential for young adults. It's important to begin to talk with your young adult about different healthcare coverage strategies and options for them. Hello, my name is Marcia Treadwell and I'm a psychologist at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland Sickle Cell Center. I'm also the director of the Northern California Network of Care for Sickle Cell Disease. I'm here to talk with you about the importance of school and your role as a parent or guardian of a child with sickle cell disease. School is a child's occupation. That means that it's going to lay the foundation for their future. It's important for you as a parent to be in partnership with your child's school. You should meet with the school at the beginning of the school year, with the principal, with the teacher, with the school nurse if there is one, and really talk about a plan for your child. Children should attend school even when they have minor aches and pains, but they should prevent the pain from getting worse by drinking plenty of fluids, getting rest when needed, and sometimes at school they may be allowed to take some medication such as ibuprofen. If the child has more moderate pain, they still should probably go to school, but then they may need to rest as soon as they get home. If they need to miss school at all, make sure that they get their homework when they're in the hospital, um, and make sure they, again, stay on top of their homework even if they're feeling ill. If the pain is severe, of course they need to seek medical attention. So again, it's good to have a plan so that you know the difference between mild, moderate, and severe pain, and so that people don't panic or so that they don't get overprotective. We have a pain plan at Children's Hospital where we outline those, the steps to staying well, to taking care of moderate pain, and to dealing with severe pain, which again is to seek medical attention. Sickle cell disease can cause learning problems, attention problems, and planning problems. So if you notice that your child uh, isn't doing well in school or has a sudden change in how they're doing in school, 
you should ask for an IEP. So with the IEP, what can happen is that you could get regular, some changes in the regular classroom, the child might need resource specialist, or special classes. Very rarely do children need homeschooling. We really think it's important for kids to stay in school. That's for social uh, development, but also school is set up as a group setting so that people kind of understand how other people think, hear different opinions, and that's a very important part of learning. So we very rarely recommend homeschooling. Another topic is physical education. Activity is important for overall health for all of us and for children with sickle cell disease. But children with sickle cell disease may be anemic, and so they might get tired easily. They might be only to run, be able to run two laps instead of four laps, but they sh probably should not not do PE. Children shouldn't stay home from school because of bad weather. They can dress appropriately for the weather. Uh, you can share um, resources with the school, such as this uh, tip book from the T CDC, and it goes over the different things that we've talked about. Again, hydration, activity, being aware of your child's emotional well-being. So again, children can get discouraged if they are, are tired or sore or miss a lot of school. And so it's important as a parent for you to listen to how they're doing, encourage them to talk about how they're doing, and let you really know what's going on with them in school. Finally, building self-esteem is important at any age and school is an important key part of a child with sickle cell disease development and ability to develop self-esteem. Praise your child. Again, talk with them, listen with them, help them get involved with things other than their illness, and help them to succeed in school. The first step is staying in school. The second step is monitoring the school progress closely to make sure that no problem is coming up. And the third step is to get help if the child needs it. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Keith Carollo. I'm the director of the Pediatric Sickle Cell Program here at UCSF uh, Children uh, Hospital in uh, Oakland. Uh, this afternoon I'm going to talk to you about uh, neurological problems in patients uh, with sickle cell disease, in particular children. So, uh, Historically, about 10% of children with sickle cell disease ended up having strokes, uh, similar to what uh, you might see in an older adult where they have, uh, paral they have paralysis on one side of their body um, and they may even have some uh, cognitive uh, learning disorders following a stroke. In about 1992, uh, in Atlanta, uh, Dr. Uh, Robert uh, Adams developed a test to screen for stroke called a transcranial Doppler. Uh, in this study, he showed uh, that children with sickle cell disease uh, could be screened and they could be uh, stratified as to who, uh, which children would uh, be at risk for stroke. So nowadays, uh, we can uh, predict who, what children will have a stroke, and we start doing these transcranial Doppler studies when they're about two years old. They continue annually until they're 18 years old so that we don't miss any child uh, who might uh, be at risk for stroke uh, so that we can start them on chronic transfusions to prevent neurological uh, problems. The, uh, there was a second study to determine how long children with sickle cell disease had to stay on transfusions uh, following an abnormal TCD. Again, this study actually was never uh, accrued enough patients in order to show whether or not um, you could stop transfusions as during the time they were um, accruing the patients, there were so many young people who had uh, abnormal TCDs and a couple of uh, children who had strokes that th that study was stopped even before they accrued enough patients uh, for the study. So this means that once you have an abnormal transcranial Doppler and you're uh, seen as at risk for stroke, you're on chronic transfusion therapy, that's a transfusion every month for the rest of your life in order to prevent you from having a stroke. At this time, we don't really know 
how long that would be. But we definitely have children or young adults in their 20s who have been on transfusions for 15 years uh, due to stroke risk. Things that we found about uh, cerebral vascular disease uh, in children and young adults with sickle cell has come because we now have much, much more sophisticated uh, scanning, MRI scans, MRA scans, perfusion scans, so that we can see problems uh, in the brains of children with sickle cell disease before there's any manifestations. In the future, it may be that half of all children with sickle cell disease are on chronic transfusions for some sort of cerebral vascular disease or small areas of uh, brain injury. The, the other thing that has been around for a long time but hasn't been utilized probably as much as it should be uh, because it's time consuming and rather expensive is neuropsychological testing. In summary, I'd like to just say that brain injury in children with sickle cell disease is very common. Probably half of all children with sickle cell disease have some sort of brain injury. Currently, we're in the process of trying to determine the most effective method of screening children for brain injury and treatment besides uh, chronic blood transfusions uh, that would be uh, available for children. My name is Maggie Greenblatt and I coordinate the hospital school program um, at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland. And we basically are part of the Oakland Unified School District. Um, some of the staff are hired actually by the district and some are hired by the hospital. But our mission is to provide educational support services for kids that are in the hospital uh, from three to 21 years of age. And so we have a special ed component and um, that teacher works with the very young all the way through 21 years. And then we have a regular ed component uh, that's responsible for working with children from transitional kindergarten all the way through the end of high school. And sometimes we'll help with college placement issues as well. So while a child's in the hospital, assuming they feel well enough, um, there will always be a team of staff and volunteers who go daily to meet those children and try to get them to do some schoolwork. So one thing that um, you as parents can do to help your child out and us out is when your child's admitted to the hospital is contact the school, let them know that the children are in the hospital and try and get their homework. For children that have cancers um, or who have sickle cell disease or some of the other chronic conditions, what we seem to find is that they, they miss a lot of school and so they're at risk of falling behind. And sometimes you've probably seen that can result in um, students feeling kind of turned off from school actually. What we try to do is build self-esteem by encouraging our students um, to, to do what they like to do. And so that could be almost any topic. You can really extend any topic of interest into an academic one. And so it's building again kind of a a therapeutic relationship with the teacher. It's also getting the kids to get excited about things and to maybe write about things or to do a public speaking about something, to do final reports. We've had kids do senior projects on areas of interest. And because we work so closely with the child's regular school, we're able to give credit, sometimes in really creative ways, um, for children. So, also, when children are newly diagnosed with cancers especially, what happens is they're often not ready to return to school after their initial treatment or even during the periods of time between hospitalizations. And so another piece of what the school program does is to help support that transition out of the hospital but into a different academic arena, and that includes getting services for home instruction. So we work with the district, um, each district is obligated to provide at no cost teaching services in the house and so we sort of are the go-between between between getting the medical piece of information and contacting the school so that that child when they leave the hospital continues to get support, educational support. 
um, the child may come in back and forth between home and the hospital. And so again, we're sort of that, that triangle. Um, for some kids who've had strokes or who have had other kinds of medical conditions that impact their learning, again, we would also help set up an appropriate level of service for teaching when it happens in the home. And that's where the special ed piece comes in. That teacher can advocate for getting the child assessed uh, and again, providing the right level of support services that the child's gonna need when they go home. Um, so we tend to work with kids mostly while they're in the hospital and then in between. Uh, and for children that are gonna be followed on an outpatient basis for a long period of time, that's where the neuropsych people end up following those kids. If you come with textbooks and things from the school, it helps make that transition between the, the home and the hospital that much more seamless. And one of the most important parts about school is it's kind of a sense of normalcy for your child. And it's what they're used to doing when they're not in the hospital. Um, that's what they do with their peers during the week. And so we try to provide one more really important aspect of normalcy and children feeling mastery over what they would normally be doing. And that is learning more, interacting with other kids. So the school can be a really social experience too. We have a classroom for children to come and you know work as a group, but we also come to the bedside. So if your child's not feeling that well, but they wanna be involved in an activity, we can come to the bedside uh, and provide learning experiences there. I would say about our school is that we're considered kind of a non-traditional school um, so that we can provide a range of really strong academic support, but we also have a lot of wonderful enrichment. We have a man that comes every week and does origami. We have um, an art science class where they combine sort of different integrated curriculum. So they combine aspects of both we have another art for resident um, person that comes once a week. We have dance that happens every week. So there's really wonderful sort of supplementary arts and different things that will get your child very excited about being involved in the school program. Hi, I'm Dr. Pam Oren. I'm a psychologist in the oncology program. One of the best things you can do as a parent for your child in the school system is to advocate for them and to get the information that you may need to be an advocate. We provide school reintegration services to hematology and oncology patients at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. Within that, we provide school presentations to uh, classrooms. We also go into the school and do presentations to the school staff. We do neuropsychological testing and we also do school reintegration services such as attendance at IEPs, SSTs, and 504 meetings. Today what I'm going to be talking about is the difference between an SST meeting, a 504 meeting, and an IEP meeting. I'm going to start with what is an SST meeting. An SST meeting is a student study team meeting and is the pre-referral action plan. Um, it's a process for intervention. What that means is it's the first step towards any sort of interventions for children in a school setting. The purpose of an SST meeting is to establish a problem-solving process and to identify strategies and interventions and or programs that may be beneficial to help academic attendance or behavioral issues that children are having in school. It's also the first step to determine if these interventions will suffice or if they need to advance to a 504 or an IEP. In an SST meeting, the parents or guardians, academic counselors, an SST coordinator, the classroom teacher, and a school administrator. The process is that first, anyone from the school or any parent can request an SST meeting. The referral should include information that's specific to the concerns that they're having about the child's learning capacities and any previously attempted interventions and or accommodations. The team members then review and collect information regarding the student's progress, including information in their cumulative file, observations, grades, reports, and tests. They then establish a time to meet when all members can participate and be actively involved in problem solving process. The SST meeting team representative then summarizes the strengths and concerns and discusses an action plan. And this is a plan for interventions with documentations and monitors for success. 
This is basically the first line defense in any sort of accommodation for children in school. If the parents, the family, or the school finds that those interventions that they put in place are not leading to increased success, it's probably a good idea to proceed to what we call a 504 or an IEP plan. A 504 plan is a, um, compliance with a 504 plan is a fe federal statute. It's based in part on the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and it prohibits discrimination based on a disability. As I said before, this is a federal statute, so some schools might say that they don't adhere to a 504 or IEP process, and that is simply not true. And we can certainly help you with that at the hospital. Back to a 504 plan. Um, again, it prohibits discrimination based on disability. What is a disability? It's a mental or physical impairment that limits a major act life activity such as going to school. And this impairment lessens the student's ability to access learning because of learning, behavior, or a health-related concern, such as sickle cell disease, hemophilia, or an oncology diagnosis. Therefore, that alone qualifies them to have a 504 plan. The purpose of a 504 plan is to decrease discrimination based on disability. And who is involved in this is the teachers, parents, a school administrator, and a counselor. Now the responsibility for carrying out a 504 plan falls to the general classroom teacher and the general education services are provided by the school. I want to clarify that a 504 plan is not the same as special education. Many parents think that if they sign their child up for a 504 plan they are stigmatizing them by putting them in special ed and that is not true. Uh, anybody can refer a child for a 504 plan. That means a parent a doctor, a psychologist, a school district staff, but the school district must also have reason to believe that the child is in need of services. Any child with sickle cell disease, hemophilia, or an oncology diagnosis, the school district has to have reason to believe that they need the services. And this can be a level of protection against children who needs to come to the clinic for regular scheduled checkups um, or have any interventions in the classroom. No formalized testing is required with a 504 plan. They look at the cumulative file. They take input from parents and teachers and classroom staff. The child remains in regular education when they're on a 504 plan. And, but they do have some accommodations and strategies in the classroom to increase the likelihood of success. Some of these accommodations on a 504 plan may be more time on tests. They may be peer assistance with notes computer-aided instructions, behavior plans, visual aids, even things like finding a place at school to rest if the child becomes tired can be put in a 504 plan. Having water at their desk can also be part of a 504 plan or wearing a hat. These are reevaluated every three years. There's no testing in a 504 plan and the school's not required to pay for any independent evaluation of their learning process. If a parent disagrees with a school evaluation decision, they can request a due process hearing or file a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights. There are many, many rights for parents that come with a 504 plan. The last and, and most significant um, intervention that we place in schools for children is called an IEP. An IEP is an Individualized Education Plan. It is mandated by the Individuals with Disabilities Act, or IDEA, and the purpose of, a, of an IEP is twofold. One purpose or one goal is to set reasonable learning goals for the student in the classroom. The second goal is to state what kind of services the school district will provide to the student to increase their likelihood of academic success. These plans are individualized to address a child's specific education needs. This is special education and the deficits in, their, in the child's learning abilities and cognitive abilities must impact their ability to learn in some way. With an IEP, schools must do their own testing on students to determine their eligibility for IEPs. We at the hospital do provide neuropsychological screening for our hematology and oncology patients, but that testing alone cannot suffice for an IEP. We can often bring those tests to supplement what the school has done, but the school needs to do their own independent evaluation. Most students in the hematology and oncology department who qualify for an IEP qualify under the classification of OHI, which is other health impaired. 
anyone can recommend an IEP after they have gone through the SST meeting. So that means school staff, parents, administrators, counselors, but parents must put the request in writing and submit it to the school. Districts vary on their response time to a written request for an IEP, but it needs to be somewhere between 30 and 60 days that they set up the initial IEP meeting. Once everyone is in agreement that a child qualifies for an IEP, the patient is formally assessed and tested by a school psychologist within the school district. The parents and teachers then meet regarding the results of the testing. And at this meeting, the parents can bring whomever they want to bring. It's often very helpful to have an extra set of ears or a professional from Children's Hospital to come with the parents to the meeting. The team then reviews the assessment and the results and discusses the findings. They then create a plan for intervention and they assign school staff to monitor and carry out all the different steps in the IEP. At the conclusion of an IEP meeting, a written copy of the IEP must be provided to the family. IEPs must also have an annual review. However, if the parents find that the needs of their child have changed or the, the, the settings in the school district have changed, they can request an IEP more recent than annually. And if a family has disagreements about what is brought up in an IEP, they can request an appeal through the fair hearing. And there are also a lot of advocacy organizations in the Bay Area that can help with school related disabilities. IEPs do provide for accommodations in a school setting. They provide for a much higher level of accommodations than a 504 or an SST meeting. Some accommodations that are common for hematology and oncology patients in an IEP meeting are tutoring, nursing assistance, individual testing services, special day class placement, transportation, and physical education accommodations. We know that this world of SSTs, 504s, and IEPs is very confusing. Um, and so we have professionals through the school program at Children's who are more than happy to assist with any questions you might have about that process. I'm Dr. Kristen Jacobson, and I'm the Pediatric Neuropsychology Fellow for the Departments of Hematology and Oncology. I'm here to talk about what we can do when a child's thinking and behavior is affected by their sickle cell disease or cancer and the associated medical treatments. I think it's best to start with what a child neuropsychologist does. What we do is that we aim to get a whole child perspective by looking at the many abilities that affect a child's learning and behavior. Um, especially with regard to their learning, we think about looking at their reasoning abilities or their IQ. Uh, we look at attention and concentration, memory, uh, and their thinking speed. The way that we do this is by interviewing the parents regarding their child's strengths and any concerns that they might have about their child's learning or behavior. We also gather medical and psychosocial history from the parents. We then administer a series of tasks, mostly which are paper and pencil based, um, and we use these tasks to garner information regarding a child's learning strengths and weaknesses. Um, and we do this in an evaluation process that takes between one and three hours. Meanwhile, we usually have the parents filling out questionnaires that help to give us a real world understanding of how their child is functioning in comparison to his or her peers. We also use our own observations and uh, ask the child questions during another part of the interview process. At the end, we produce a detailed report and we review the results with the parents. Some of the reasons that you might think about getting a neuropsychological evaluation for your child would be to identify changes or risks of changes in their ability levels. Um, these might be caused by their illness or their treatments. We also can use our reports to track the fit between your child and his or her school environment or um, their environment in general. We can use our data to help plan for needed school and or behavioral supports and also to develop strategies to build on strengths and compensate for any difficulties that we might find that your child is having. All of our uh, reports have the ultimate goal of helping the parents and the teachers to understand the effects of illness and treatment um, that a child might be experiencing and also to promote optimal functioning of the child. Sometimes neuropsychological evaluations discover hidden reasons that a child is struggling. 
So for example, sometimes our reports can, un can uncover findings that show uh, illness or treatment effects, perhaps underlying conditions that existed prior to their diagnosis, um, or even sometimes poor sleep habits and psychosocial, um, perhaps mood problems that affect their functioning. In our reports, we aim to provide recommendations uh, such as accommodations through 504 plans or IEP plans. Uh, we also recommend other school interventions with the child's classmates or school staff that might help the child uh, reintegrate back into the school setting more smoothly. Sometimes we recommend social skills interventions such as counseling uh, to address issues like peer rejection or alienation as well as follow-up evaluations or different treatments like speech therapy, medication evaluations, or sometimes even hearing and visual examinations. Hi, I'm Dr. Satsby Bogie, uh, the pediatric neuropsychologist for the Departments of Hematology and Oncology, and I'm here to talk in more detail about the effects of sickle cell disease, cancer, and treatments in children at our hospital. I'll begin by talking about cancer. Uh, many of the children that we see are followed for leukemia. And while leukemia itself doesn't tend to cause direct effects on a child's learning, it can affect how they feel and behave. The treatments that we give can cause effects on learning. With children who have brain tumors, the brain tumor itself can have an effect on the brain by compressing or damaging brain tissue, um, or in some cases by causing hydrocephalus, which means that the fluid that surrounds the brain can be blocked and can also cause pressure on the brain and cause changes in functioning. The types of treatment and cancer treatment that can affect a child's learning and behavior include chemotherapy and radiation. There may be acute effects seen during treatment when a child may be feeling poorly, may be experiencing nausea and fatigue, and may have difficulty concentrating or remembering things. When treatment is completed, there may also be further changes after the acute effects have gone away that are known as cognitive late effects. These are often not noticed for a year or two until treatment is completed and may become progressive or a little bit worse over time. And it can be difficult to track or understand these difficulties without having the help of a neuropsychological evaluation. These effects can be very great, unfortunately, if a child is very young they may be much milder if a child is post the onset of puberty when they're treated. Either way, we are there to continue to follow the child, check in on their development, and make appropriate recommendations to help with their planning and, and, and uh, follow-up in school. <clears throat> if a child does have late effects, while they still learn, they may show a slower rate of learning than their peers or age mates. And if they have very pronounced late effects, they may actually show drops in their scores over time because even though they continue to learn, they do it with a flatter learning curve or they, require, they acquire information more slowly than peers, causing their rates of learning to drop. All the children that we see have needs that may change over time. So we often repeat our testing every couple of years or so to update our results and treatment planning. Some of the effects that chemotherapy can have include changes in attention, memory, speed of processing of information, and other factors called executive functions, which are higher order cognitive abilities, such as working memory. Working memory essentially refers to uh, mental juggling ability, or the ability to hold multiple forms of information in mind at the same time. Also, fine motor functions can be affected. These refer to uh, small motor skills that, that involve the fingers and hands and that can influence their ability to write neatly and to take notes efficiently. This is primarily due to vincristine. The major form of chemotherapy that we're concerned about is methotrexate, which when it needs to be administered at a high dose can have significant effects, including those mentioned before, but also even affecting potentially IQ, visual motor abilities, visual perceptual problem solving, reading and math among other areas. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about radiation. At the lower doses, we tend to see milder effects unless the child is extremely young and is at the higher end of the low range. For If it, uh, radiation is given at higher doses, uh, particularly in the younger kids, we can see significant changes. And again, if the children are post the onset of puberty, these changes tend to be milder. 
Now I'd like to talk a little bit about sickle cell disease and how the illness can affect the children that we see and also how treatment effects can occur. In the case of sickle cell disease, these treatment effects are beneficial. Sickle cell disease often has an impact on children's ability to think and learn in different areas. For some children, this is mainly due to having had strokes in their brain. Some children may have uh, silent strokes, which are not evident on imaging, but may nonetheless affect their thinking and uh, thinking abilities and behavior. Some of the effects from stro strokes may include impact on their general mental ability level, or IQ, which essentially deals with their learning and reasoning abilities. Also, their attention and memory. Their, again, their executive functioning, which was discussed a little bit earlier. Their language and visual motor uh, and academic achievement skills. Children who have not had evident strokes may have milder effects from silent strokes. These tend to impact things such as verbal IQ or verbal reasoning, attention and academics, especially in reading and spelling. The effects can also be due not to silent strokes, but to changes in blood supply and oxygenation that are not tied to stroke events. Difficulties in learning in all these children can be seen as early as five, six, or seven years of age, which is when these brain-based changes are thought to begin. Treatments in sickle cell disease can be of help with children's learning and behavior. Hydroxyurea, in particular, can be used in, uh, to treat, and we see in outcome studies that the children with this treatment show higher performance on our tests than those who have not received it. Bone marrow transplants may also be of help, but they, this has been less studied. It is thought that treatment improvements are due to improvement in blood oxygen supply to the brain. In terms of needs for planning, children with sickle cell disease often need help in planning for school support in IEPs or 504 plans. Uh, they also often need help with planning for uh, what they're going to be doing after high school, whether that be college or uh, vocational planning. Uh, in addition, they may need help with social stressors and helping with disease complications such as pain and sleep deficits. And finally, they may need help as young adults in learning how to manage their own medication regimens, which can be complex. As a team, we can help with both sickle cell and cancer children populations with educating teaching staff and helping parents to understand their child's strengths and difficulties. You also can seek help with various types of professionals that are affiliated with us in our hospital, and these include physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech and language therapists. Occupational therapists and speech and language therapists can also help with things such as memory skills, executive functioning support, and learning how to organize. Finally, when you go to school, you should ask about options that may be useful for your student, uh, including resource support planning programs, reading specialists, after school tutoring programs and study halls in which a child can get help with their homework and learning um, note taking skills and study skills. Also you can seek help in a private context with tutors, educational therapists, executive functioning support and we'd like to offer you if you contact us some information on how to access these resources. In that case when you come to the hospital please ask to be put in touch with somebody from the psychology or neuropsychology teams. My name is Barbara Beach. I'm, I've been a pediatric oncologist here at Children's Hospital Oakland for about 35 years. I'd like to give a brief overview of childhood cancer and the more common clinical situations that we encounter in pediatric oncology. The most common diagnosis in childhood cancer is leukemia. And the most common of the leukemias is acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which we also call ALL. Children with ALL in general, um, have a, uh, a good prognosis. Most of those children actually do well with their treatment. It does consist of chemotherapy. The girls are generally treated for about two years after diagnosis, and the boys a little over three years from diagnosis. Most of the children with ALL are able to return to school sometime after the first several months of intensive therapy. And by the time many of these children go back to school, they actually look quite normal. Their hair is growing back, it may be short, but it's there. And they may look really quite similar to when they left school right after the diagnosis. However, just because they look the same doesn't mean that they are the same. And so we very much would like parents to involve our team and you can talk to any member of the team to get the process started. The other most common childhood cancer diagnosis 
is a brain tumor. In general, the children with the brain tumors may have a very different situation than the children with leukemia. Depending on where the brain tumor is located, it may affect the child's ability to speak, it may affect their vision, it may affect their ability to walk, uh, they may require a wheelchair, they may have a limp, and so that child may appear quite openly very different from when the child left school at the time of diagnosis. Again, it's very important that the school reintegration process be undertaken so that that child will not hopefully be bullied, that that child will be treated with dignity and respect and with compassion and acceptance by his or her classmates. I think it's important to um, be very proactive about school reintegration for two reasons. One is from the perspective of the child who has been diagnosed with a cancer and is going to be returning to school. Oftentimes that child has been absent from school for weeks or even months and coming back to school can be quite traumatic. That child may look differently than he or she did prior. They may have lost their hair. They may have either gained or lost weight and their ability to move around may also have changed particularly if the child has um, a brain tumor. The other um, important aspects of this program for the child who is being treated for cancer is that the classmates need to have age-appropriate explanation for what this child has been through. We like, whenever possible, to be able to inform the classmates in an age-appropriate way so that hopefully this child will not experience any bullying. It also, having the reintegration by a member of our staff also frees the child from having to repeat over and over and over again to the other children in the class what the situation is. The other issue is that the child who's been diagnosed with and is being treated for cancer may have experienced a change in his or her learning style as a result of either the diagnosis, particularly if the diagnosis is a brain tumor, or as a result of the treatment. And finally, this child may have mobility issues. The child may now need to use a wheelchair or may not be able to walk as well, may have to have alternative physical education class. From the perspective of the classmates, life has changed fundamentally for this child and their family. And it's important that the classmates understand not in any detail, but just in general, what has happened. And our experience is that when children are given appropriate information, they can be extremely compassionate and extremely helpful for the child. But when they're not given information, they can unfortunately begin to exhibit behaviors that are very detrimental, both for the child in terms of bullying and for themselves. I'm Alma Hernandez, I'm an oncology social worker. And um, some parents understandably feel nervous about their children having to have neuropsychology testing. It's natural to feel anxious if you're going to find out whether your child has difficulty with memory or some aspect of learning. But what I tell families is, if there's a problem, it's gonna come out sooner or later. If your child is having difficulty in school, he or she could start acting out or try to avoid school altogether. But if you know about the areas where your child is having difficulties, then you can start working with the school to develop a plan to help your child. So the sooner you know what's going on, the better. I also tell parents to prepare themselves for some work when they're advocating for their child at school. Parents have to put requests for assessments and IEPs in writing. And some school districts are slow to respond to these requests or slow to provide support services. So parents sometimes really have to be the squeaky wheel. And sometimes you even have to ask for help from outside agencies. In California, there are parent training and information centers throughout the state. These centers provide information and support to parents who are trying to obtain educational services for their children. In the Bay Area, the local parent training and information center is run by the Disability Rights and Education Defense Fund, DREDIF. Social workers can help parents contact these centers. Some parents will even have to seek legal help with these school issues.
For low-income families, we refer to legal aid centers in the community in which they live. And locally, the East Bay Community Law Center has been very helpful to families from our hospital. If you need help advocating for the educational needs of your child, be sure to let your hospital social worker know so that you can get the support that you need.